Next question, we will start with Charlie Jones, area four. The school board in the district can be heavily impacted by decisions and debates at the state and national levels. We've seen that in past meetings here or in the old board, old board room. Uh, just a few of the recent legislative topics that come to mind, LGBTQ student safety, parent notification, gender identification, smartphone use at school, removing books or banning the removal of books, ethnic studies requirements, AI regulations, social media protections, and of course, funding. Um, we got so many questions about these sorts of topics suggested uh, from, from parents and, and readers coming into this forum in here tonight. So what is one piece of state legislation you've been following closely for how it will impact education in Pleasanton? What is your position and why is it such an important topic for schools? I love this question. Um, I do political involvement for my for teacher association and one of the bills that I've been helping push for and lobby is the paid pregnancy leave bill for for both teaching and anyone in staff education that would guarantee 14 weeks of paid leave for any for anyone that's going through pregnancy within the district that is involved in education. That is huge because right now we don't get pregnancy leave. It's actually insulting. You have to take your sick days and declare your pregnancy a sickness and then spend your days. And then once that's done, not only do you lose those days, but on average, women will make $10,000 less in their retirement than male teachers will because of this. And so I've been lobbying and pushing really hard for that bill because it's important. It would actually be revenue neutral and allow you to not only not use your sick days, but you'd still be a part of Cal Stirs, so you wouldn't be losing out on your retirement. This is huge. This gives you time to bond with your family, the family that you're starting, the child that you have. It's giving you that time, and you're not having to quit. You're not having to schedule when you're having a kid, which is insane. Perfect. No other profession typically has to do it to that degree like teachers do. So I'm incredibly, incredibly involved in this one because it truly does matter to me. I believe that we should be treating people who want to start a family with dignity. You shouldn't have to choose between your career and being a mother within this district. So yeah, I'm very passionate. Um, I've spoken with Liz Ortega, who's one of our assembly members in this area. I uh, worked with Congressman Eric Swalwell. Uh, we, I've also written and pushed about getting rid of what's known as GOP or GEP or WEP, so that if you've done social security before becoming a teacher, you can actually collect that and it's discharged onto the House floor within the next 10 days. They will actually be voting on that, and we think we might be able to get it to the House. Thank you. Donald Harris, area three. All right. Well, I'm bummed because Charlie picked mine, so I had to think of another one. But, um, but there, there are a lot that I pay attention to and care about, um, and a big one is uh, is is literary censorship and, and the books that are available to our students. Um, I, I know that um, here in, uh, in California, PUSD, maybe it's not quite as, as, as pertinent uh, a topic, but um, from what I understand, there are, there are some um, ideas about creating committees in order to, uh, to bring aware, not bring awareness, but to, uh, to, to propose banning some books um, for elementary and well, for all of K-12. K um, I think that anything that brings attention to books that will compel children and students to read them is a good thing. Um, there's, um, there's a saying, there's no such thing as bad publicity. Um, I think that if there are people who want books banned, I think that that's a, a great reason to, to read them. And I also think that anybody who wants to ban a book should absolutely have to do a book report and prove that they read it before they decide that they want to have a ban. Um, and then I think that they have to stand up at a board meeting in front of everybody and uh, not only deliver that book report, but also take questions from, from the audience uh, to ensure that they uh, know and really truly comprehended everything that they um, were objecting to. That's my take on that. Thank you. Kelly Mokashi, Area 3. 
Yes, thank you. Uh, so as an elected uh, trustee, I have already taken part on this process. I did highlight that, but I wanted to reiterate it again. I have lobbied for the dyslexia screener for students who are struggling in reading K2. So what that means is I spoke in Sacramento in front of the education committee advocating for that dyslexia screener, which uh, CTA um, formally did support as well and working in collaboration to actually modify that bill before it was passed. That also included talking to various elected officials um, to also present that case prior before it was approved by our governor. But our work isn't done. While serving currently on the policy uh, committee with the district, one policy I'm very interested in flushing out further with the district is artificial intelligence. One of uh, our star teachers um, has actually taken initiative to actually um, begin that work. I hold a uh, partner, this teacher, with uh, one of my former colleagues in the ed tech industry who's doing this nationwide with districts um, throughout the U.S. and how to put together um, artificial intelligence policies. And that experience has actually pivoted my thought process because initially I wanted to stay away from AI and chat GPT and some of the negative aspects of how students might use, misuse um, artificial intelligence. But in conversation with many different teachers, um, and I won't make call them out here, but um, there are some benefits of how to improve instruction using the various tools of artificial intelligence effectively. Um, and most recently, our students um, at one of, at Amador put together using artificial intelligence to screen fact check one of uh, the debates um, most recently with our presidential campaign. So there's a lot of growth there, and I support that. So those are one of the policies that um, I look forward to working in the district. Thank you. Thank you, and Jen Flynn, area four. Okay, I'm gonna to touch on something a little bit different that's near and dear to my heart, because I have teenagers. Uh, AB 3216, the Phone Free School Act. As of July 1st, 2026, uh, all districts will need to, have, need to have a cell phone uh, restricted policy, policy restricting the use. So both high schools right now have a pilot program, which I love, and the children come into class, they have a little pocket, they put their phone in it, the teacher uses that for attendance. If your phone is not in the pocket, you are not in school as far as your, you could be in the classroom. But it's just a little incentive to make sure you put your phone in that pocket. Uh, we live in a, technology, a technological world, right? But there are countless studies showing that trouble students have trouble concentrating when they have their phones in class. I have a teenager who has long hair who purposely has earbuds in because his hair can cover it. So I think it is important that they, when they're in the classroom, they're focused, they are learning, and also important for our teachers to not have to monitor TikTok while they're doing their educational. Um... And yeah, so I look forward to have clear, having a clear policy and working with the district to make that policy and then also just implementing it at the school sites. Thank you. Thank you. 